Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to our second lecture, uh, BC 106 on interpreting scripture. So we're now going to get into the next, uh, maybe we can cover two more uh, guidelines on interpreting scripture. The next one has to do with grammar, uh, studying the, the word that is used and um, trying to correctly understand the meaning of the word. So when we're reading scripture, we must pay attention to the word, the grammar of the word, how it is used. Right? So we must keep in mind that the Bible was written in a different language. So we are reading it in English. But it was written in Hebrew, Greek. And a small portion of it in the book of Daniel was written in Aramaic. But mostly Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek. So it is written in a different language. And then it is translated for us in, right now okay, we are reading, reading it in English. It's translated to us in English. Which means that we must keep in mind that the word that is translated into English, of course, the English translators did their best, but sometimes the actual word could have multiple meanings. Like just like in English, also we have you know, there are some words which could have different meanings depend on depending on the sentence and the context in which it is used similarly in hebrew and greek the word the original word could have many different meanings and so depending on the context we have to try to understand it but also keep in mind the possibility of that same word having another meaning being used in that sentence or being used in that text. Right? And so uh, the meaning of words, the tense, is it past tense? Is it present tense? Is it future? Is it present continuous? The tense of that word is also important. If it's past tense, it means he's saying it is done or it is past, then we have to stay with the tense of the word, how it was written, right? So that is also important. So when we are studying the word, Bible, don't change the meaning of the word, don't change the tense of the word. I mean, stay with the correct grammar of the text. Right? That's very important. Right? Because if we change the tense, then the whole meaning can change. When God says, I have done something, and we say God is going to do it, then we, are, we have changed what God said. God said, I have already done it. We are telling people God is going to do it. Hey, no, no, no. He has said it in the past tense. We have to say it in the past tense. Right? Otherwise, there will be a lot of confusion. So understand the meaning of the word, the form, the function, and the relationship of the words in the sentence and, how, and the, the way the author, the writer, is using the word. So let's look at an example. So take, for example, the Greek word dunamis. Okay? So the, there's a Greek word. Or, yeah, the, the Greek word dunamis is often translated in, the, in English. It's translated power. But there is another Greek word that is also translated power. Dunamis, and there's another Greek word, exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. Exousia. So dunamis and exousia are both are two different Greek words. But in the English language, especially in King James, New King James, 
uh, some other translations. They are both translated with the same English word, power. So when you're reading the English, it will say, example, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, I am giving you power. Oh, no, Acts 1, 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Luke 10, verse 19. Jesus said, Behold, I'm giving you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt you so in Luke 10 19 the word power is used two times right in some versions it may be I'll, I'll give you the correct meaning but it's looked at in Matthew 28 18 Jesus says all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Now, these two Greek words, dunamis means power as in ability, what someone is able to do, ability. Exosia correctly means power as in delegated authority. So one has to do with ability, what you can do, what you're able to do, supernatural ability, dunamis. Exosia has to do with authority, delegated authority, what has been given to you. But in English, it's in some versions, it's the same word power that is used. In some versions, they have tried to differentiate it. Dunamis will be translated power. Exosia will be translated authority. Okay, so think about this. Luke 10, 19, both dunamis and ex exosia are used. Behold, I give you exosia, authority, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power, dunamis, of the enemy. Right? I'm giving you authority over all the ability of the enemy. Right? Acts 1 8, you will receive dunamis ability, God's ability, supernatural ability. You will receive dunamis power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So there he's talking about the supernatural ability of God being given to us through the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 8. You will receive power, dunamis. So the believer has dunamis given by the Holy Spirit, the believer has. Authority exosia through the name of Jesus. You understanding now? Right? So in English, uh, we use the word power, we use the word authority, but in the Greek, there are two separate words. Okay, one dunamis has to do with ability, what you're able to do. Exosia has to do with authority. Something that's given to you. Delegated authority. Okay. So when you study the, the Greek, then you can see the difference. Oh, I understand it now. You know, and then when you look up the scriptures, and as you study the scriptures, you ask the question, oh, it's translated power. But what is the Greek word behind it? Is that Greek word dunamis or is the Greek word exosia? Because depending on the Greek word, the meaning actually is different. But sometimes in English they just translate it, it's power, power, power. But what is the Greek word? 
example, Luke 6, 19. The whole multitude sought to touch him because power went out of him and healed them all. So power went out. Okay, what is the Greek word? Dunamis. Oh, some, some Bible translate virtue. Power. You know, power went out of him. Then Luke 5, 17. It says that as Jesus was teaching, the power of the Lord was present to heal. Now what power? So look up the Greek. It's a power, divine ability, God's power was present to heal. Right? So depending on the context, I mean, depending on the Greek word there, you can say it's the power, meaning an ability, or power as in authority. Example, policeman. This is an easy example. When policeman puts his hand up and says, stop the car, does he have the dunamis to stop the car? Think about it again. Does he have dunamis to stop the car? He has no ability. But does he have exosia? No. He has the authority because he's in the uniform. But if some admi comes in no uniform, he puts his hand here, stop the car, will they stop? No, they'll honk him, <laughs> go. They won't stop because no authority. He's not wearing the uniform. Right? They say, who are you? What are you doing here? So it's because he has a uniform that gives him that delegated authority. He doesn't have the ability. He cannot even, he cannot stop even a bike. Bike, uh, they go fast. <laughs> he, has no, he doesn't have the ability to stop. But because of the authority he has, they will stop. So the difference. Okay. So, like this, this is one example, you know, where uh, uh, you look up the Greek uh, or Hebrew, depending on it, and you study the word, how it is used, what does it mean in the original language, what is the meaning of it, how is it used. So then, when we translate it in English, we have a better understanding of what is being said. Even though in English we may use the same word, power, or, and it can mean different things. Now, some things we must not do is just because the Greek word sounds similar to some words in English, don't say it means the same thing. Example, dunamis is a Greek word. It sounds very similar to two English words. It sounds very similar to dynamite, or it sounds very similar to dynamo. But neither of these things, neither of these words, are conveyed in the meaning of the word dunamis. But sometimes you'll hear nice sermons. Oh, Dunamis, you have dynamite in you. Dunamis, you have dynamo in you. Actually, it's not correct. Now, it's a nice sermon. People say, hallelujah, clap their hands and go, fine. Nobody died. It's okay. <laughs> but technically, it's not the right thing to do. You know, nowadays, people can preach anything. People don't understand it. So it's fine. It's like, it'll go on. But technically, if you look at it, it's not the correct thing. Because Dunamis is not talking about dynamite. Dynamite is, you know, in, we use dynamite to explode things. You know, it's explosive power. But Dunamis was talking about ability. Right? Whereas dynamite is, you know, it's it's a chemical reaction. It's a power that is, you know, used to destroy, break things down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's actually not contained in the original Dunamis. But it sounds same. Greek, English word sounds same. So people preach it. Dynamo sounds similar to dunamis. It, it's not contained in the word dunamis. Dynamo, here in dynamo, what we're doing is we're converting mechanical energy to electrical energy. So we put the dynamo on the bike. Uh, I don't know. Nowadays, we don't see it. But basically, you know, some many years ago, on bicycles, they'll have a dynamo, which will, will attach itself to the, I mean, will rest upon the tires. So when the tires rotating, it'll rotate. Uh, you know, basically converts mechanical energy to electrical energy. It'll power the 
bulb of the cycle. Uh, it used to happen. I, I don't see. I don't see it around these days. But basically, a dynamo converts mechanical energy to electrical energy. Now that idea is not conveyed in the word dunamis. But just because it sounds similar, you'll hear sermons on, or oh, you have received dynamo. No, it's not true. <laughs> okay, but people preach these kinds of sermons because uh, technically it's not correct, right? Because even though the words sound similar, dynamis, dynamite, dynamo, the words dynamite and dynamo are not contained. The meaning, the same ideas are not contained in the Greek word dynamis. Okay, so we shouldn't be technically preaching that. Uh, so be careful. Just because some words sound very similar to the English words, don't preach that. Understand the correct meaning of the Greek word. What does that word contain? Then use it. If it's contained in it, yeah, then you can explain that the word means this. And sometimes, and you will start when you study the Greek word, yes, it's some words are very fascinating because that word does mean multiple things and it does contain in it beautiful imagery and so you can bring that meaning of that word out and that's beautiful but if it that's if the word contains it then you bring it out right but don't make it up or don't do it just because it sounds similar to an english word you've got to check this that sing, similar sounding english word is it contained in the original greek word so some guidance when we are studying the grammar and this is where Eastward comes in. You know, this, is where, this is where I like to use Eastward. And I like to use the dictionary, Vines Dictionary and other dictionaries. Why? Because they help us understand the meaning of the Hebrew and the Greek words. And they will tell us, you know, this word also means this and also means that. And also is, this is the uh, image behind it. You know, for example, uh, when Paul says, I am a servant of Christ. Oh, you go look at it. Oh, he's saying he's a bond servant. Oh, the word bond servant actually means a servant. You know, the picture is that of a servant. He has his ear pierced. It's a sign that he has committed himself to his master for life, even though the master was ready to let him go. So that picture is in the word bond. So in English, we simply say servant or bond servant. We just translate it. But when you study further in the Greek, oh, it's a beautiful picture. What it means to be a bond servant. So, you know, it, it is a deeper meaning than the English word. So when you are explaining, when you're studying, you can bring out those meanings. Right? But you have to look it up. Uh, so any tool that you can use um, uh, that helps you study the Hebrew and the Greek, the dictionaries, this is where those tools are very helpful for us to study. Okay, so determine the uh, uh, established usage by the writer. That means when the writer was writing, what did this word mean? You know, in their time, what was the meaning of this word? You know, try to do that. Of course, you have to study to do that. Also, look at the context in which the word is used. Also, what is very helpful is when you see how the same word is used by the same writer in all of his writings. Example, the Apostle John uses the word abide in his writings. He likes it. He keeps on using abide, abide, abide. <laughs> he uses John, in the Gospel of John, you know, John 15, abide in me. I abide in you, if you abide in me, and all that. So many times you would abide, abide, abide. Then you go into his epistles. First John, again, a lot of time, many times, he uses abide, abide, abide. I mean, the English word. So this writer, John, he likes this word. He's using it so many times in his, in his writings both in the Gospel of John, Episode of John. So then you study. What, how is this particular writer, that is, in this particular case, we're talking about John, John the Apostle. How is he using this word, abide? What's he trying to convey? Because for him, it's a very 
big word. It means a lot for him. Similarly, Paul the Apostle, he uses, you know, uh, the word fullness. Fullness. Paul likes to use that. The fullness. And the fullness of God dwells in him bodily. You are filled with all the fullness of God. You know, I pray that you will be filled with the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, Colossians 2. He uses the word fullness again and again. So you think like, okay, what is he talking about? Fullness. And then you look up the Greek. Okay, he's talking about some substance that completely fills us. And, uh, and he's trying to communicate the very... Uh, essence of God filling either Christ or the believer. You're filled with all the fullness of God. You are complete in Him. He is the one who fills all things by Himself, Ephesians 1. So He uses it in many places in His episodes, especially Ephesians and Colossians. So you study the word fullness as it is used by the writer. You know, because this is how the writer. Paul, in this case, was using this word fullness. So look it up everywhere he uses the word, and then you'll get an understanding of that meaning of that word. And then you use that to interpret everywhere he's using that word. Okay. Same thing about phrases. Paul the Apostle example, he likes the phrase, Pray in the Spirit. So, the, how should we interpret the phrase, pray in the Spirit? We have to interpret that phrase as what it meant in the mind of the writer. What did it mean to the Apostle? Paul. And he used the phrase, pray in the Spirit. He uses it often. Ephesians, First Corinthians, two episodes that you find it quite often. So, what did it mean to him? Not what I wanted to mean, but what did it mean to him? So, you put, you take every place where you find the phrase "pray in the Spirit" in the writings of the Apostle Paul, and if you want. You could extend it and say, what did that phrase mean to the early church? Because even Jude uses it. Jude chapter 1. He also says, pray in the Spirit, pray in the Holy Ghost. So then you say, hey, that means this was a phrase that was used not only by the Apostle Paul, but in the early church. What did it mean to them? So rather than me coming in my 21st century and trying to tell what it means, I must go back to the time of Paul, time of the early church, and say, what did this phrase mean to them? You understanding? That's the correct way to interpret that phrase. And it's very easy to see because when, when you go to 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, yeah, you know, uh, let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 14, I'll just quickly give it to you. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 14 and 15, he says, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, 15, it says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, I will also sing with the understanding. So it is very clear that in for Paul, the phrase praying with the Spirit is different from praying with the understanding. To pray with the understanding means to pray in your own known language. To pray with the Spirit is to pray in tongues. Context, look at the previous verse, verse 14. Or if I pray in an unknown tongue. Very simple, I think, nothing complicated. So for the Apostle Paul, the phrase pray with the spirit simply means to pray in tongues. It's different from praying with the understanding. Understanding means in your own mind, with your known language. Very clear. 
Now, modern Bible commentators, commentaries, you will see, to pray with the Spirit means to pray with a lot of energy, to pray with a lot of passion, to pray with a lot of excitement. Is that what Paul meant? No. What did Paul mean? To pray with the Spirit means to pray in tongues. Now, you may have excitement, you may have passion, you may have all that, but correctly, for Paul, to pray with the Spirit means to pray in tongues. So what these Bible commentators are doing is, they are taking 21st century idea and pushing it off on Paul. Paul never meant that. To correctly understand the phrase, pray with the Spirit, you have to start with, what did Paul mean? What did it mean to the church at that time? Don't push our idea now on him. Go back to him. Go back to his time. Correctly understand from that perspective. How can he do it? Example. Look at how he used the phrase in his writings. And be faithful to that. Right? So interpret it from that perspective. Because he's very clear. And you can compare other scriptures. Right? So I'm just giving an example. Where a word or a phrase has to be interpreted correctly as it was originally used in the language by the writer, by who, the one who was writing. Okay. So consider the context, note the usage of the word by the same writer in the same book, note the usage by the same writer in his other books, and note the usage by other writers in the Bible. So keep that in mind. So now, I'd encourage you, you know, to do some studying. And I've just given some examples here. If you're interested, you can study a few Hebrew and Greek words, hell and death, uh, Gehenna and Hades. So here's, a, again, another thing. There are parallel words in Hebrew and Greek. Okay. So Hebrew, Gehenna. Hell. Greek, Hades, hell. Right? Parallel words. Okay. So they're used across the testaments. Hebrew, Ruach, spirit. Pneuma in Greek for spirit. Okay. So here's again very, very challenging thing. There's only one word in Hebrew or one word in Greek for spirit. Both these words, ruach and pneuma, literally mean breath, air. Breath, air. Ruach, pneuma. Hebrew, Greek. But, depending on the context, that word spirit could mean Holy Spirit. It could mean the spirit of man. It could also mean evil spirit. Same Ruach or Pneuma. So now this is a different kind of a challenge. One word could mean three different things, depending on how it is being used. It, but it means the same thing. It means air, breath. But when it is Ruach of God, then it is Spirit of God, with a capital S. When it is the Ruach of man, it's the Spirit of man, some person. And it's an evil spirit, evil Ruach. It's an evil spirit. But it's the same Hebrew word. Or you, you come in the Greek, pneuma. So here's a different kind of a challenge. So here, you have to look at the context very carefully and then interpret. So now, example. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Kindness, meekness, goodness, temperance, faith. Galatians 5.22. 
the word spirit is pneuma and it can refer to the holy spirit it can refer to the human spirit it can refer to the evil spirit so my question the fruit of the spirit which spirit is he referring to which spirit why do you say that Ah, huh, capitalist was put by the translator <laughs> because uh, the translator thought. See, in the Greek, it's pneuma. Translator said, "Okay, context has to be Holy Spirit, so I'll put it capital." But it is debatable. Why is it debatable? Question: Who bears the fruit, the believer or the Holy Spirit? Who bears the fruit? believer or the holy spirit ask the question again who bears the fruit the holy spirit bears the fruit or the believer has to bear the fruit believer has to bear the fruit so that new mark there is a little debatable because fruit of the spirit context definitely is the holy spirit because paul says walk in the spirit you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh be led by the spirit you will uh, not fulfill, you know. Fulfill. So context, yes, he's talking about Holy Spirit. But the debate is, the fruit has to be borne by the believer. So how you can say fruit of the Holy Spirit? We have to say fruit of the human spirit. I'm just making it confusing for you. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is a debate. Okay, so don't get surprised. Suddenly, somebody is preaching a sermon. You have to bear the fruit. That is also true. Jesus said, "I am the vine; you are the branches, and you bear, bear the fruits." Right. So, if you hear somebody say, Galatians five twenty two, the fruit of the spirit, that spirit refers to the human spirit. No need to fight about it. No need to fight. I can agree with it. Why? Yes, I as a believer have to bear the fruit, but the fruit I bear comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not my own fruit. So whether you translate it with a capital S or a small s, I'm happy. Doesn't matter. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has to work in me. Only then I can bear the fruit. So how you fight? You all fight. I'm happy <laughs> because it is only the Holy Spirit. Who can help me bear the love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, meekness? Only the Holy Spirit. So now, while I understand that debate, should it be capital S or small s? Because the Greek word is the same Greek word. I understand that debate. For me, I take it as, hey, the Holy Spirit has to work in my human spirit. He has to help me. Only then I can bear all of this. So for me, both. We understand how it works, but I'm just saying that it is debatable, and both are right because that's how it actually works. The Holy Spirit helps the believer in His Spirit produce the fruit. So whether you say fruit of the Spirit with a capital S, or whether you say fruit of the Spirit with a small s, I'm happy. Doesn't matter. I understand what you're saying. I, no, no need to fight about it. Similarly, if you study the word love, um, it's very interesting. You know, uh, you'll find English, it is translated love. Greek, I think there are four or five words, maybe four words, different Greek words. So, it is always good to go back and say, oh, which, which Greek word is he using here in this context? Is it agape? Is it filio? Is it uh, uh, agape? There are four different Greek words. Uh, four, four or five, I think. Four Greek, Greek words yeah, they used. Okay. Similarly, faith and hope, uh, sorry, faith and belief. 
Faith is a noun, belief is a verb. But they come from the same root word in Greek, right? Faith and belief. They come from the same root, root word. So actually, you can use them interchangeably, just that one is a noun, one's a verb in the Greek. Okay? In English, we're using two different words faith, belief. But if you go back to the root in the Greek, it's talking about the same thing. Talking about the same thing. So believe God or trust in God or have faith in God, and so on. And the word power we have already seen. Okay, so I just try to emphasize the importance of studying the the Hebrew, the Greek, looking at the grammar, the usage of the word, so that we can correctly interpret the scripture. Right? Uh, look at it. Pay attention to the word. Let me uh, see. All right. Let me look at some questions here. Um, Roshan has some questions here on the our chat. Pastor, praying in tongues includes passion and excitement in the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, well, you know, we can pray in tongues without necessarily being uh, excited or having feelings. So passion and excitement has to do with our emotion. Now, the fact is... Many times when you pray in tongues, there may not be any emotion, you know. So usually when you're praying for hours in tongues, you know, that you're just praying in tongues. You may not have uh, that passion, excitement. Sometimes you do, sometimes you may not. So I, I wouldn't equate the two. I wouldn't necessarily say every time we pray in tongues, there has to be passion, fervor, and excitement. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way, right? Um, next one. Yes, source is the Holy Spirit, but we are the instrument through which the fruit manifests. Yeah, so that's fine. So we, we stay open to both capital S and small s when you talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, good. Any other questions from those online or those in class? Any questions? Grammar? Yes, Sean? Uh, so, why uh, so why I mean uh, we we know that uh, we have Hebrew and Greek and from there we translate to English. But why are there so many translations in the, uh, in English? Uh, you know, for uh, people who are reading the Bible in English, there is mm. King James, there is NIV, and there is like uh, the good news. Why can't it just be like King James? Because since it's more more uh, it's more close to the uh, translation, the di uh, more direct translation. Okay, so Sean's question is, why do we have so many translations of the Bible? So, um, yeah, I think we will be doing this. Uh, uh, maybe I'll just share it with you. But we will be looking at this in our course on apologetics, um, which I think we do it in our third semester. But let me just share with you very quickly why. Um, I will just share with you. So if you see this chart, it might help you understand why. So next year when we do apologetics, we will cover this. But let me... I don't know. Did we cover it in this class? Oh, actually we did, right? I. Uh, I, I think I did. I did it in. Uh, oh yeah, we did it in uh, interpreting scripture. We did it in. Let me go back. I think we did it in tools and methods. Yeah, in, in lesson number three, uh, we did this. Yeah, we we looked at this. Yeah, so we did it in this course as well. So we will repeat it there in apologetics. But yeah, we did it in lesson number three. So. Why are there different translations? So we explained, right, earlier in this course, in lesson number three, um, we explained that when the translators set out to translate from the original Hebrew and the Greek, they decide how they want to translate it. And there are different methodologies for translation. So they can be word for word, thought for thought, or paraphrase. So we have Bibles that are paraphrased, like Message Bible, Living Bible, 
contemporary English, Good News Bible, uh, New Living Translation, all of that. Paraphrase means they're not an exact word for word. They're like a summary, a gist of what was said. Uh, and the reason they do that is because they're targeting a different audience. They're targeting an audience of people who uh, want something easy to read. You know, it's more like reading a story or something light. There are people who like to do that. And then there, is, there are these word-for-word -word translations. So New King James, King James, Revised Standard Version, uh, uh, English Standard Version, New American Standard Bible, and Interlinear Greek New Testament. So these are the word-for-word -word translations. So they are the ones that are very meticulous. And they want to do the word-for-word -word translation. So those are closer to the original text. And then you have a, a whole lot of ones in the middle that are thought for thought, meaning for meaning. Right? That means they, are, they do a little bit of interpretation for us. Right? They say, this is what we think the writer was thinking, and so we put that down for you. So it's not exactly a word for word, but a thought for thought, and a meaning for meaning. So passion translation, others are like that. Yeah? So that's why we have these translations, meaning uh, the translators are have a different objective in the way they do. And then we are we are given the opportunity to choose what we want. You know, if somebody wants to read paraphrase, that's fine. It's very easy to read. If somebody wants to read King James, okay, you can read. For some people, it may be very difficult uh, to do that. So, so that's why we have um, many of these translations. Okay. Uh, so but like, how can we? Like, how can you say that? I mean, we know that those three, like word for word, thought for thought, paraphrase, are all uh, are, are all like right. We can't say any of them are wrong. But the thing is that um, when you're like talking to someone about the Bible, and suppose uh, let's take uh, I'm like trying to talk from good news, but uh, he's read like KJV, you know, KK, the, something that's more closer, like word for word. So like. Um, how how does that work? Like what I'm saying is also right, but what he's saying also is right. When you're not able to agree, we're having a disagreement because of this. Yeah. So especially when it comes to establishing doctrine, right? We uh, we must go as close to the original text. That we must apply these principles of uh, hermeneutics of interpretation. So we must go. So regardless of where we start, you know, whether we start from a paraphrase version of thought for thought or meaning for meaning or even word for word. I think when we want to establish doctrine or establish what it all, okay, what is the, the real thing that was said, we need to go do a thorough study, right? Uh, apply all these rules and then say, this is what I am convinced. So whether I start from a good news Bible or whether I start from a King James version, I need to go back and say, yeah, I have studied and I'm convinced this is what it means. So if we come from that perspective of a thorough study, then OK. If somebody still differs with me, it's, it's fine. I, I know what I, I've studied it. I've searched for it myself. And I'm, I'm convinced that this is what it actually means. And so I can be firm in my conviction. Right? And if somebody differs, OK, I'm not going to fight with them. They're free to hold to their opinion. Uh, that's fine. But at least I've studied from the original. I know what it actually means and convinced of. But of course, in um, you know, when it comes to the core doctrines of who is Christ, God the Father, God the Son, God the Father, those things we can't compromise. You know, but other things, yeah, it's fine. You know, uh, that doesn't matter. But the core doctrines that we cannot compromise. Okay, so anyway, so you can study Hebrew and Greek words if you're interested, and so on. Now let me just introduce one more topic. I think uh, we'll continue this next week. Uh, let me see if there any questions on the live chat. Uh, Roshan, you raised your hand. You have a question. Yes, Pastor. Uh, I I have a question in regards to the NIV translation. That is, there are some verses that I found out in which are there in King James, like which are very important verses, but you don't find that in NIV. Like, for example, in the epistles of John, <clears throat> he says that there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when you check it in NIV, it's not there. So there are some verses that have been skipped in the NIV. 
Hmm. So my question is: Is it authentic, like the NIV, to recommend it to others? Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Yeah. So what Roshan is pointing out is um, that uh, in some versions, and he, he mentions NIV, and there are others as well, where uh, certain scriptures may be certain texts, the texts of certain scriptures may be omitted. Now the reason that happens is, like we said, Roshan, um, there are two sets of manuscripts, right? One set of manuscripts, and 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 the translators take one of the two approaches. They wanted one translate, one set of translators want to go back to the manuscripts that were as close to the original. The others use the approach of what is most commonly found. So there are two approaches for translation. So in that process, they would leave out certain verses and they would say, and in most Bibles, there will be a footnote somewhere. They will say, these verses are not found in these kind of manuscripts. So that's what you'll find uh, in the NIV. They will say, there'll be a footnote somewhere that says, okay, we, we have left this verse up because it was not found in these set of manuscripts. So they are saying, look, we used these set of manuscripts and these verses were not found there. So that's when we have to go back and say, hey, uh, let's go back to the original. Let's go back to the one that were closest and see if it is there and then you know go from that. So most of these verses, uh, I'm talking about, you know, that were left out in the NIV, would have these footnotes indicating that the translators have left them, left them out because they are staying with one set of a certain set of manuscripts, and these verses were not found there. Therefore, they have left it out. But that doesn't mean they're not in the original. Uh, they are there in a set of manuscripts that go back to as close to the original. Yeah. So that that causes a little bit of confusion, like you said. But it's always good for us to go back and check uh, the original. And also to ask another basic question, is this an essence of what, you know, is of the teaching of the scriptures? Uh, I, I don't know if we have time. Yeah, we have two minutes. Uh, so example, you know, uh, Mark chapter 16, the verses 16 to 20 are left out in certain translations of the Bible. But then the basic question you have to ask is, hey, uh, are these scriptures consistent with the teachings of Jesus? The answer is the exact yes. So perfectly fine. You can believe it and live by it. It's, it's not contradictory to the rest of the scriptures. It's just that some translations leave it out because the set of manuscripts they used uh, didn't have it. Okay. Um, quickly, uh, Nina, uh, the answer to your question is yes. Right. So Ephesians 6, 18, Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So we interpret Ephesians 6, 18 consistent to the, how the writer, in this case, the apostle Paul, used that phrase. And so when he says pray in the spirit, he always means praying in tongues. We can say that with utmost confidence because we see, like we saw earlier in 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15, uh, 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 yeah, 13 and 14, what the phrase praying in the spirit means in the mind of the writer, which is the apostle Paul. So if you look at some commentaries on Ephesians 6, 18, you'll find those commentaries saying, oh, to pray in the spirit means to pray with a lot of fervency, a lot of zeal, a lot of passion. All that is nice, but that's not the, the actual meaning of the phrase in the mind of the writer, Paul. The actual meaning of the phrase pray in the spirit means pray in tongues, Ephesians 6, 18. Okay. Okay, we're going to close. We'll pick this up next week. And uh, take this forward. We're, we're kind of putting things together piece by piece uh, on how to interpret scripture. Let's uh, close in prayer, please. Father, we thank you uh, for the learning. I pray that, uh, Lord, these things will be imprinted in our hearts and minds so that we can use them, Lord, as we study your word and uh, as we minister your word to people. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you, everyone. Take a break, and you can be ready for the next class. Thank you. God bless.